So in a moment, we're just going to turn to uh, Chris. I think Anne is also going to read um, the scripture of the week. Uh, and uh, each Friday, in, uh, we're going to just be reflecting on encourage you to spend a few minutes just reading that scripture in advance of Sunday. Um, I've spent a few minutes just thinking about it and thinking about the question that Chris had posed. Uh, and I just felt Jesus started speaking to me just even in those few minutes. And I'm looking forward to hearing now what Chris has got to say and then taking a few minutes uh, as the week goes on just in this scripture that can help me follow Jesus better and that will shape me into the kind of person that Jesus wants me to be. So please do look out for that in the newsletter on Friday. Take some time just to reflect on it. Uh, and then uh, we will hear from somebody each week. So this week it's going to be John 18, uh, and uh, Chris is particularly asking us to think about why does Jesus ask questions? So Chris, I'm just going to pray for you, then I think Anne's going to read a scripture, and we're looking forward to hearing from you. So Father, we thank you for Chris. I thank you so much for who he is in our community. Thank you for uh, just the years of walking with you, the knowledge, uh, the wisdom, the generosity, the graciousness, uh, that it is in Chris. We we bless him and thank you for him. And Father, I pray that as he just shares this morning, that you would speak to us and that uh, this scripture would come alive and it would shape us, it would nourish us, and uh, we would follow you more clearly uh, and more nearly uh, through uh, what Chris shares this morning. So I pray for your blessing upon him. Amen. Chris, you should be able to unmute yourself. I think Anne is going to read the scripture. Uh, there you go. Oh, hold on, Chris. You should be able to unmute yourself, I think. There you go. You're on. We can hear you now. Uh, uh, okay. Sorry, I have some real difficulties here. Okay. I think I should be fine now. The truth is, I can't hear you now, but you can hear me. You have some slight technical difficulties here. I am um, so... I am... Um, I think that'll be fine. Um, so this morning, uh, we're continuing on a series, a summer series, uh, which is entitled Good Question, which Naomi has teed us up with. And I love this series. I love the idea of it. Uh, the, the premise is that God asks questions. In fact, he asks loads of questions. According to Dr. Naomi, there are over 500 questions in the Bible that God asks. And uh, Jesus asks questions. When Jesus appears on the scene in the Gospels, we find him asking questions. And that's what, uh, one of the things that we want to really look at this morning. Uh, our passage is in John chapter 18 and verses 33 to 38. That will come up on your screen shortly. And Anne is going to read that for us just now. Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus and asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Is this your own idea, Jesus asked, or did others talk to you about me? Am I a Jew, Pilate replied. It was your people and your chief priests who handed you over to me. What is it you have done? Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jews but now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, you are right in saying I am a king. In fact, for this reason I was born and for this reason I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. What is truth, Pilate asked. With this, he went out again to the Jews and said, I find no basis for a charge against him. Brilliant. Thank you, Anne. Um, so uh, why is it that God asks so many questions? That's what we're just going to be pondering. And in particular, why is it that Jesus asks questions? I'm going to try and keep an eye on the chat as we go. I'm not promising that's going to work very well, but Anne is going to help me and give me a nudge if there's anything there that I uh, can maybe respond to. 
So um, let's start with another question. Um, how would you answer this? What must I do to inherit eternal life? Okay, somebody comes to you out of the blue, maybe somebody at work, somebody in, in, in your neighborhood, one of your relatives, and said, um, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, what would your response be? How would you answer that? I suppose a classic evangelical, evangelistic opening would be the four spiritual laws, you know, just going through them one after another and laying down the facts of uh, how to be saved, how to inherit eternal life. Well, how did Jesus respond to that? His response was, why do you call me good? The inquirer had said, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus' response, why do you call me good? He answers a question with a question. And what effect does that have? What difference is there between making a statement, for example, all you need to do is believe in me and you will be saved, or the question, uh, putting it back onto the inquirer and saying, look inside yourself a little more and see what you find. Here's another question for you to consider. And I'm just going to check the chat here. What language did Jesus speak to Pilate? Likely it was Latin. Excellent. That's probably true. Um, and let's assume so. So I can't say this in Latin. Um, and this was a question actually from the Jewish leaders to Jesus. Is it right to pay taxes? Well, what if somebody came up to you and said, is it right to pay taxes? Well, you know, it is a good way to honor God. It's a good way to provide for the poor. On the other hand, it's taking away what you've earned. I mean, there are different opinions. My own opinion is blah, 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 blah. Jesus answered, whose portrait is this? He answers a question with a question. Quick check. Where is Colin when we need him? <laughs> Indeed, where is Colin? He's actually down in London eating eels and doing things like that. I'm not quite sure. So Jesus asks questions. Why does he ask questions? What effect does that have on the inquirer? What response does that draw out? Is it a passive response or an active response? How have you felt about the questions I've been asking this morning? Does it, does it engender something in you? Does it uh, call out something of a response from you? Is it as an observer or as an en engaged actor? The thing about questions is that they invite dialogue. They invite exchange active exploration and ownership of the things that are said. A question invites you to discover for yourself, to expose and examine your own suppositions. It invites active investigation, not simply passive assent. And a question invites the ownership of truth. You know, I said that, it just came out of my mouth. It's mine, it's my truth now. So, Great listeners, as many counselors, as all counselors probably understand all too well. I uh, hope counselors, I know, uh, value this highly. Great listeners ask questions. Now, why does a great listener ask questions? Because they're interested in you. They're not so interested in saying, this is what I think. They're interested in asking, what do you think? And a question draws out the inner assumptions in another so that there can be true dialogue. So we're gonna look at a classic Jesus conversation this morning, which is filled with questions between Jesus and Pilate. So we're looking at John chapter 18. If you have that in front of you, if you don't, that's fine. Jesus has been arrested. He's been taken before the high priest and then by them to the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate. It's early in the morning and it's been a long night. Pilate asks the Jews, so what are the charges that you're bringing against this man? The Jews respond, if he were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. So he's not really receiving from the Jews a, a charge and he needs to establish that for himself. So going to our passage, Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus and asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Literally in the Greek, I don't know what it would be in Latin, um, it says, you are the king of the Jews. And because we don't have punctuation in the Greek, is that a statement or is it a question? There's sort of uh, ambivalence there, uh, dichotomy. But uh, we assume from the context that it's a question. You are the king of the Jews. Now, intriguingly, this title was never used by the Jews themselves. The Jewish leaders used a different title. They said the king of Israel. Um, 
but we only ever find this uh, title, the King of the Jews, in the mouths of Gentiles. Firstly, at the beginning of the story, when the Magi came asking, where is this King of the Jews or King of the Judeans? We have come to worship him. And now, winding all the way to the end of the story, we're right at the, at the climax of the story in some ways, uh, in the mouth of the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate, this title is spoken. In some ways, it is uniquely Pilate's um, title for Jesus. King speaks of government and authority, something Pilate understood very well. I mean, it's a concept that he lived in, that he embraced, that he, his whole life was shaped by. It gave them a, a common meeting place of the Jews, king of the Jews or the Judeans, the people who Pilate governed. Also, the Jews, it speaks of the religious leaders, the custodians of the faith of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and those who follow that faith. And so this phrase had both political, which um, Pilate understood and related to, and also theological implications, which was probably further away from his understanding and his grasp. And it had a third implication, which was a personal one, because it was, it was Pilate himself who uh, came with this phrase. So Jesus responds, at this stage, I might be thinking personally, this is a legal proceeding. I, I could be in big trouble. I need to be careful about how I answer and what I say. Well, it's not exactly a king in the way that you're thinking, governor. It's more, more of a Jewish idea, more of a you know, heavenly thing. It's not really threatening your thing. And I am, you know, I would probably proceed in that manner, hoping to soften the blow of the charge. Jesus does go on to explain some of those things to Pilate, but his, from his first response, it's clear that his focus is elsewhere. He has no immediate thought of defending himself. He's focused on the man before him, the troubles, the pressures, and the reality of the man in front of him. And so he asks this question in response to the question, are you the king of the Jews? He asks in turn a question. He says, is this your own idea? Or did others talk to you about me? Again, literally in the Greek, do you say this from yourself? Does this come from out of yourself, Pilate? Or is this a question which you have heard from others and are simply repeating? Jesus is not looking for information when he asks questions. This is always true. He asks questions for a particular purpose. Rather, he is looking for the person. He's looking to uncover, to unfold the reality of the inner life of that person. And so he asks a question. So here's one more question for you. What is the difference between your own idea and something that you heard someone else say? Is there a difference in your own investment? in your commitment, in your valuing, even in the way that you identify with the question. Jesus is asking, what is in your heart, Pontius Pilate? Where did this question come from? Is there a flicker of faith there, which God himself has ignited? I want to find it and to fan that spark into flame. He knew he wanted to lead Pilate to discover what is in his own heart and out of his own mouth to make a declaration of believing. So Pilate responds, he says, is this your own idea? Jesus says, uh, Pilate responds, am I a Jew? Pilate replied. He understands the implications of Jesus' question. Are you trying to make me into a Jewish believer? And he goes on, it was your people and your chief priests who handed you over to me. What is it that you've done? Let's talk about things that I understand as a governor, as a judge in the situation. I want, to under, I want to talk about acts and facts. What is it that you have done? Pilate moves, up, moves the question back into more familiar territory. Jesus then responds again, not with another question, but with a statement which doesn't seem to directly answer the question. What is it you've done? Well, uh, Jesus responds, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jews. But now my kingdom is from another place. He doesn't answer the spoken question of Pilate. Instead, he speaks again to the heart. You're a ruler. I'm a ruler too, but of a different order. Pilate then bursts out. You are a king then, said Pilate. 
What was it that Jesus just heard? He heard an open confession from Pilate out of his own mouth. You are a king. Jesus answered, you're right in saying that I'm a king. You are right. Literally, you say that I am a king. You just said it. I didn't tell you. You told me. Now, why is that so important? Why is it that speaking something is so vital? See, in Romans, Paul uh, tells us that if you confess, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord or Jesus is King, we might say, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So why is being asked a question so important? And while I just pause there, I'm going to see, because there's one or two other things happening here. No immediate thought of defending himself, says Rupert. Great comment and so applicable as we follow Jesus. Uh, Christina, maybe slightly off topic, but when asked a question, how many of us change our answer depending on who around us? Yes, that's true. Uh, you know, are we going to reveal everything to everybody? No, not necessarily. And so it's uh, something in the inquirer or something in the, in the one who asked the question, I believe, that can draw out winsomely a true answer from the heart uh, and, and engage trust. So <clears throat> why is being asked a question so important? Because the answer comes out of our mouth. Once it's spoken, it is seen, it is alive, it is creative, it's faith giving. It's personal and it's yours. So Jesus goes on. In fact, for this reason, I was born. For this reason, I came into the world to testify to the truth. Now, I want to ask one more question. What is the difference between truth and testimony? For example, if Jesus had just responded to the question, are you the king of the Jews? Yep, I am. That would have been true. But how would that have engaged Pilate's heart? Both things have to do with actual reality, truth and testimony. One of them is established by a third party, an authority perhaps, who affirms a universally held observation to which you give assent. The other one is a first-hand account of what has been personally experienced, not just truth, but testimony to the truth. Jesus goes on, everyone on the side of truth listens to me ah, says, what is truth i i can't even deal with these things i mean i'm a go i'm a governor and i am governed i am under authority i have pressures from every side people demanding things of me i don't have time to think what i think i have to be aware of what the governors what the what the um um emperor thinks what the jews are saying to me i've got all these things coming even what my wife says to me um, and I don't have time to look into my own heart. And you are uh, penetrating in. You are looking into my inner thoughts. With this, he went out. Pilate went out again to the Jews. And he said, I find no basis for a charge against him. Now, in some respects, we've, we've come to the end of our passage now. I just want to say one more thing about Pilate, who obviously is in the spotlight here. In some respects, the title King of the Jews becomes not only owned by Pilate, but also broadcast by him. He's already uh, spoken it out of his mouth in the conversation to Jesus. And then he goes out to speak to the Jews again. And he says to them, do you want me to release to you the King of the Jews? He, he declares that name, that title. And then he says, here is your King. This is a King. He's a King. He's your King. And then he says, shall I crucify your king? So three times he affirms Jesus. He doesn't say who you say is a king, who we are suggesting is a king. He affirms that he is a king. And then very significantly, three times on the charge notice, Pilate, it says, had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross in Aramaic for the Jews, in Latin for the Romans, in Greek for the whole of the rest of the world, so that everybody would know and hear this proclamation, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. And John, who is writing this account, goes on to say many of the Jews read this sign. Pilate has become a mouthpiece. <laughs> In a very short period of time, 
he has become somebody who is objective, who is detached from this situation, who has been forced upon him, to one who has been personally engaged, who, who is actually affirming something which the Jews are trying to deny. And uh, it goes on to say, Pilate answered, what I have written, when the, this is when the Jews challenge him and say, don't just say he's the king of the Jews, say he said he's the king of the Jews. Pilate stands firm. He says, what I have written, I have written. And for Beth, quod scripsi, scripsi. What I have written, I have written. Who else was there at this point in the account who was standing on the truth of, who, of Jesus' identity? You see, this account just follows immediately after the account of Paul, Peter's denial. Three times Peter denied Jesus. And here is the Roman governor of all people affirming who he is and determining to stand his ground when he is challenged. As Jesus once said of a centurion, another Roman's confession, a man who understood authority, I tell you the truth, I have not found such great faith, no, not in Israel. Now, I'm aware that uh, history has uh, given different accounts of Pilate, um, particularly the Eastern Church has uh, elevated him and has understood that he was a man coming to faith and arriving in a, a, in a place of faith. And actually, there's a document which I came across uh, in preparing this called the Acts of Pilate, the Acts of Pilate. Um, and it contains a letter, an account that was written by Pilate to the Emperor Claudius. And it's astounding. How reliable it is is another question. It comes from the fourth century. It's the earliest attestation of it, but it's astounding. And I'll maybe post that on the community page for those of you who would be interested. But the question of where Pilate's journey led from here um, is a good one. But the reality of what's right in front of us is he was moved to the point where he would um, attest to who Jesus was. So just in bringing this all together, let me ask you a couple more questions. Just check in the chat Peter okay Jesus always provoked deep thinking with questions when he was physically present with men could it be that God now uses situations happenings to ask us questions absolutely Peter so here's a couple more questions for you whose are your convictions whose are my convictions are they what I have heard from others say and I give an assent to or are they from within have they become my own truth? Do I assent to truth or can I own and testify to it? Has that reality become a hill on which I would die? Second question for you here is how do I seek to share the truths that I've come to know? Do I, would I do that by bold assertions? Well, there's a time for that. Or by winsome questions that draw out the inquirer with confronting statements or with engaging inquiries. So why is it that Jesus asks questions? And I'm gonna leave us with a couple of um, things to think about. We're gonna take just a few minutes to do this and then uh, right after that, hand back to Rupert. I'm gonna suggest um, like a good teacher uh, that you attempt one of the two in this exam and uh, the questions are going to come up on your screen just now. The first one is, just think, what is one truth that you know that you know, that you really know, that's foundational to your reality, that you would own and could never deny? That's the first thing to ponder. And you may want to spend the next few moments thinking about that. Or here's another one. What is your heart question of Jesus? What is it that he answers you? Uh, with what question? So thinking about, you know, if Jesus was before you right now, what is the one thing, if you had a chance to ask him one question, what is the question that you would ask him? And how do you suppose he would respond to that? With what kind of question maybe would he respond to you? And then how would you respond in return? I'm going to leave you with those things. God bless you. Thank you for listening. And um, we'll be handing back to Rupert in just a couple of minutes.
Let's just take a moment to reflect on these questions. We have another song coming up from Paul in a moment. Let's just take a moment to reflect on these questions. There's a, a song that I've been singing or listening to over the last few weeks and the lyrics go like this. Um, and this will be my song that you are always good. I'll sing it all day long that you are always good. And when the day is through, I'm left with you are always, you are always good. And it's really resonated for me because that is one truth that I know that I know in the midst of all the other uncertainties. God is good. So what's the one truth that you know that you know? Father, I thank you so much that you ask us questions because you invite us deeper into something, deeper into an experience of you that, that goes beyond knowledge, into something of a deep conviction in our hearts. And I pray for each one of us now in the midst of some of maybe the uncertainties or the questions that we have, I pray that you would invite us into that deep place of conviction. Thank you for the inspiring story of the way that Jesus, you did that with Pilate and for Chris's sharing. 